Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to Help You Fall Asleep. Today, we are going to be reading True Scary Crazy X Stories. I hope you enjoy them. So without further ado, lay back, relax, and enjoy these true scary stories. He ended up in the dryer at my apartment complex in the middle of the night, naked and crying. Yes, you read that correctly. And no, I'm not making this up. I wish that I was. I found this guy on OkCupid, and he was a really nice guy, if a little strange. Good looking, too. We dated for several months, during which time he slowly revealed that he was hearing things that he couldn't possibly be hearing. His upstairs neighbors or my roommate were talking stuff about him, even though I couldn't hear a thing, and he started to get paranoid. This all came to a climax one night when we were at a comedy club with some of my friends. He had been acting strange all night and thought that my friends hated him and were all talking crap about him from a couple of feet away. They weren't. I was sitting between them. They had even told me previously that they liked him. He left before the show started and I didn't see him again. Until, eight months later, my roommate was getting ready for work one morning. She gets up around 5.30 a.m. She heard strange noises coming from the laundry room, which shared a wall with the hallway of our apartment. She thought the loud wailing sounds were from our neighbor's crazy friend, and that she'd have to deal with her when she went to the laundry room to get her bike. But when she went in there, She couldn't see anyone and wasn't sure where the sound was coming from. She searched around and was looking under the table across from the washer and dryer when she heard the dryer door being pulled shut. I know, horror movie stuff right there. She was about to open the door, but thought better of it and went to wake up sleeping me. I work in mental health. I got up and could hear the crying, so I went out to the laundry room and opened the door. At this point, the person who had previously occupied the dryer was lying face down and naked on the linoleum floor. I asked if they were okay, not knowing who it was at that point, and there was no response. I told my roommate to call the police, and while she was on the phone, this person gets up. He was actually wearing mirrored aviator sunglasses, and walks past us and into our apartment. He sat on one of our chairs and proceeded to give me a death stare while my roommate was outside speaking with the cops and her work explaining what was happening. He was in our apartment over the course of an hour while the police and later the paramedics checked him out and he did not say one word. The most he did was make a guttural growling noise while he gave whoever was speaking that hate-filled stare. Finally, the paramedics took him to the hospital and I never saw him again. I went out of town for my best friend's wedding, in which I was a bridesmaid. I didn't take my boyfriend at the time as per request of the bride. It's her day, and considering my boyfriend and I were on the outs at the time, I was not opposed to this. He's an ADD kid, and didn't get his meds refilled before I left town for four days. This is his meltdown. It started off okay. We would text back and forth, but I wouldn't be able to reply as fast because... Duh, I'm helping with a wedding. He overdosed on Valium and told me that he was wandering around outside, then doesn't answer his phone for six hours, in which I'm panicking because I'm a six-hour drive away from my home, and I don't know if he's wandered off in his messed-up state or not. I break down. My best friend's stepdad, an ex-cop, sits with me and lets me know some options on what I can do from far away. Eventually, I sent my apartment manager over to see if he had left the house or not. Apparently, he had fallen asleep because he took so many drugs. The actual day of the ceremony, he flips out again, because I don't have time to talk to him at all. 
Tensions are high for the wedding party as we're being pushed to the, get this ceremony on its way. I leave my phone in my bag while I help the bride and the groom. Come back to no less than 10 voicemails and 30 plus texts half of which are just incoherent, random letter-style typing. This continues the whole weekend. I stop responding. I come home to find my blinds torn, DVD player smashed, cooking oil spilled all over my kitchen floor that he made me clean up because apparently it was my fault that he knocked it over while I wasn't even in town. And my entire nail polish collection, over 50 colors, destroyed, I'm still finding cracked bottles. It's amazing how I haven't died from all those fumes. Red colored Kool-Aid splashed everywhere, even inside kitchen drawers. I don't even know how that happened. He didn't apologize for any of it. His only words were, you made me do it. If you hadn't ignored me, this would have never happened. We're no longer together, of course, but this is just one episode of many. This man will be 30 next month. And I pity his next girlfriend. This is my first time ever posting on Reddit. And I'm not a writer, and I'm writing this on mobile. This is something that happened to me a long time ago and I am now a much older and wiser woman. I was 20, and I moved from Northwestern England to live and work in London. I had no real experience of relationships. On the outside, I appeared extroverted and quite tough, but on the inside, I had no self-confidence. I looked in the mirror and all I could see was a fat, ugly, aggressive, and unlikable person. I now see that none of that was true, but it meant that I was vulnerable. I met a man, Robert. He was 27 years old. We dated and six months later I moved into his flat. There were loads of red flags which I stupidly ignored until I was living in a nightmare. It started with control and emotional abuse. Now, I grew up in a very rough city in northwestern England and I could handle myself and had a quick temper. So at the beginning, I gave as good as I got, but it escalated to him cheating on me physically assaulting me, locking me in the flat, isolating me, mind games, and taking my money. There were too many incidents to write about here, but suffice to stay in that 12-month relationship, he terrorized me until I hardly recognized myself. I was desperate to escape, but deep down, I always knew that when I left him, I would be in danger, so I just kept putting it off. One day, he started another fight, but this time, he told me to get out. I didn't need to be told twice. I packed my stuff and was gone within 10 minutes. I had no close friends because he would be so vile that nobody stayed around for very long. I rang a girl that I used to work with and begged her to let me stay with her for the night. She gave me her address and she let me stay with her for a month in her flat, which was about a mile away from his flat in Northwest London. This meant I had to use the same tube station to get to work. It started one morning when he was waiting at the tube station. He escalated it from that point onwards. He would be at the tube station waiting for me a couple times a week. He would stand behind me as I got my ticket and would verbally abuse me. He would never shout or draw attention to himself, but he would call me names and threaten me in a low tone of voice that made my stomach heave. I never reacted because I knew that's what he wanted. I foolishly hoped that he would get fed up and just leave me alone. Then, he started to show up in the neighborhood around my workplace in West London. I told my manager and colleagues that this was before mobile phones were commonly used. Other than keeping an eye out for him, they couldn't really do much to help me. Sometimes I would see him at a distance standing in a corner, or catch a glimpse of him in a local market, and then he would vanish. I thought I was going mad or developing paranoia. I moved out of my friend's flat into a shared house about a mile and a half away from him. I don't know any other areas of London, and I had made some friends in that area, so I didn't want to leave completely. I used the same tube station, and as I stopped seeing him there, I thought he was starting to move on. 
It took me a couple of weeks to notice the white van with blacked out windows that was permanently parked across the road from my flat. I thought it belonged to a neighbor. I was horrified when I realized it was him and he would sit in that van day and night watching me and tracking my movements. One day, soon after the van appeared, he approached one of my housemates to give me a message and asked for the telephone number. I wasn't that friendly with my housemates so I hadn't told them what was going on. They thought that he was a friend and gave him the number. From then on, he rang every night all through the night. Eventually, I told my housemates what was happening, and they promised not to let him and unplugged the phone that night. He started to leave gifts and cards on my doorstep. My room was on the ground floor, and a brick was thrown through my window. I'm phobic about birds and keep finding dead birds on my windowsill. I was a nervous wreck, flinching at shadows and jumping on the slightest sound thought about moving again, but I knew he would find me through my workplace. I went to the police, who said because he hadn't actually done anything, then there was nothing they could do. This was before stalking was a criminal offense in the UK. I would come home and find typed letters posted through the door, asking me why had I been to a certain shop or cafe or theater on a certain day or night. The letters would ask me why I had visited a certain address and who lived there. It was relentless and I knew that he was letting me know that he was there watching all the time. I wanted to leave London and go back home, but I couldn't tell my family what was happening, as my mother was seriously ill, and I didn't want to worry my dad and my siblings, as they had enough to deal with. In desperation, I decided to pretend that I left London by packing a couple of suitcases and taking them back to my home city. I knew he would be watching me, and I hoped that he would be fooled. I totally underestimated his lunacy. I would stay at my best mate's house when I returned home. I thought I saw him once, but I thought I was just being paranoid. The night after I arrived, I went out for a couple of drinks with my best friend Diane and two other friends, Billy and John. We went to a couple of bars, listened to some music, then all ended up back at her house just drinking and chatting. Billy and John left around 3 a.m. A couple of days later, I returned to London. There was a note waiting for me on the doormat. I opened it, and to my horror, it contained details of my night out. It mentioned John. It named bars where we had drank, and even the name of the band. Then he rang the house phone, screaming and ranting words that made no sense. I saw one of his friends who told me that, unbeknownst to me, the crazy ex had drove 200 miles and gone straight to my best friend's house. He had watched me go out, and waited for me to return home from the night out. Then he followed John, and waited outside his house too. The following day, when John went to his local pub for a Sunday afternoon drink, my maniac ex followed John in there, and made a point of chatting with him to find out his name, etc. This had gone on for about four months at this point. About a month later, I was on my way home from work. It was winter, around 7 p.m. and the streets were dark. He grabbed me on a side street, dragged me into the back of the van. I was petrified and crying in the dark, being thrown from side to side. All I could hear was the radio. He hadn't said a word. After about an hour, the van stopped and the back door opened, and I was in an empty car park with trees around it. He kept his hand on the back of my neck as he made me walk for about 20 minutes through what I guessed was a forest. He never said a word as I asked him where we were going and why he was doing this. It was as though he was deaf because he didn't even acknowledge what I was saying. The night was freezing and there were no lights other than his torch. I don't know how many times I fell over and got dragged back up to my feet. Eventually we reached a sort of clearing and he pulled me behind a tree with a stick and plastic bag tied to it. Then he showed me a shallow rectangular hole in the ground and said that that was my grave, and that he would happily go to prison knowing that I was dead because of all the pain that I had caused him. He pulled a short, thin blue rope from his pocket, and at that point he looked unrecognizable. His expression was pure darkness, and all I could see was his crazy eyes staring right through me. He had his hand on my throat and the rope in his other hand. I swear I have never been so scared in my life. I was shaking with terror. I honestly thought that forest clearing would be the last place I would ever see again in this world. 
Suddenly, I knew with complete certainty that I had to stay calm if I was going to get out of this alive. I told him he didn't need to do this, that I knew I was wrong to make him mad. It was all my fault and I was sorry. I told him we could get back together, and I knew now that he really loved me. In the end, God knows how, but somehow I got through to him, and his eyes cleared and he spoke to me. He agreed to let me go and get my things to move back in with him. He drove me back to my flat and I ran inside and collapsed on the floor while he waited outside. He started beeping his horn, banging on the door, and ranting and raving outside the house. My housemate rang the police, but he left as they arrived in the street. I gave him his details and told them what had happened. He denied everything, and the police said that there was no witnesses, so it was my word against his. The police told me they had warned him, but ultimately they couldn't do anything without proof. I gave them the notes he had left, the van registration, the names of people who could verify what I was saying, but still, they said it wasn't enough to arrest him and charge him. They checked the van registration, but it wasn't registered to his name. And so, the stalking and harassment continued. I started carrying a R alarm, hairspray, a screwdriver, and anything else that I thought might protect me. I hadn't slept properly for weeks, and food stuck in my throat if I tried to eat. I was a shadow of my normal self. Friends of his came to see me, to tell me to leave London, as he was obsessed with revenge because I had been to the police. I went to a solicitor who wrote a cease and desist letter. I found parts of it ripped on my doorstep. About six months from the start of his terror campaign, I was asked out on a date by Gary, who was a friend of my friend's boyfriend, Pete. I was trying to convince myself that I could carry on living with some semblance of normality. I agreed to go out with Gary if Pete came along too. After a few drinks, we went to the club. Pete, who wasn't drinking, said he would give us a lift home. We were in Pete's car, and he started the engine and drove for about five minutes. Then I heard Pete say, there's something wrong with my brakes. Then he said, there's a white van following us. My heart started beating a hundred miles per hour and my throat started to close as I asked him, does the van have the reg number one, two, three, four? To my horror, it did. It was him following us. I quickly had to explain to Pete and Gary that I had a lunatic ex-boyfriend who just happened to be stalking me right at that very moment. Pete was only driving at about 20 miles per hour. He pulled the car over, and we jumped out and ran through a housing estate of tenant flats until we lost him. We found a mini cab office, and as I was too scared to go back to my flat, I ended up sleeping on Gary's couch. Unsurprisingly, the potential new relationship ended that night. The next day, Gary rang me to say that he had been back to pick up his car, and the brake cable had been partially cut until it was nearly severed. I truly believe he tried to kill all three of us that night. Gary and Pete wanted me to go to the police, but I had lost all faith in them. Every time I had asked the police to help me, they had done nothing, and it just made things worse by reinforcing how powerless I was. Enough was enough. I knew that he wasn't going to stop. I didn't even know what he wanted anymore. That same week, I gave notice on my flat and handed in my notice at work. I booked a six-month air ticket to India, In my crazy mind, I thought, well, it's one of the most populated places on the planet, so he will never find me there. I traveled around India on my own for six months. I did a lot of thinking and healing and returned to my home city. I never returned to London. And thank God, I never saw him again. So for starters, I've been dating this girl for a while now, her name being Isabel, going on a year very soon, and all is going well in that regard. However, when we first met, she told me about a less than ideal ex-boyfriend she had a couple of years before she had met me. They still went to the same school, and he ended up going to the same university as us after we graduated high school as well. Apart from that, all three of us went to the same church meaning there was a lot of opportunity for him to meet us. The creepy encounters with him, Jose being his name, started a little before we graduated high school. After he heard that we were dating, he was furious. 
even going as far as to say I was abusive on Twitter, but nobody believed him. And he was notorious for doing the same in the past in order to keep Isabel from talking to other guys when they were together. That was just the beginning, though. It started off small at first, seeing him in the mall whenever we would go out on dates, before it was illegal to go outside. After a while, it seemed like a little too much to seem like a coincidence, though. He started showing up at our church, which, although wouldn't ever really be abnormal, he all of a sudden joined the same youth ministry as well. It seemed as if he was trying to get as close to us as possible at all times. There was one instance I remember very specifically. At a graduation party everybody was invited to. Everyone was in the backyard, and I remember looking across the patio and just seeing him staring at me and Isabel from the other side. His eyes didn't move, and his breathing was very heavy, as if he was angry, anxious, or both. He didn't try anything that night, though probably because of the other people there that night. After I left the party and dropped off my girlfriend at her house for the night, I saw a black car following me for a majority of the way home, which I really didn't think much of. And not to sound like that guy or anything, but I wasn't too worried about it either. I'm fairly well built and have done martial arts for a little over six years. The next day, that same car was tailing me almost the whole day while I was running errands. Things got a little heated in the afternoon, though. I was sitting in my car outside of a store, waiting for a curbside pickup, when he parked a few spaces down from me, got out of his car, and came up to my window. He started yelling at me, saying I would never be good enough for Isabel, that she still loved him no matter what I thought, and that he was going to make sure that she and I weren't together. I just tried to ignore him. Starting anything would have probably been a bad move given that he hadn't even touched me or my car. But I was still a little heated. After heading home, it was already pretty late, so I just played video games for a while till I was tired enough to go to sleep. When I was walking back to my room, I saw him from my window, just standing there on the sidewalk looking right at me. The only reason I knew it was him was because of the light from one of the street lamps. My parents had also seen him and asked me to go check it out, since they aren't the youngest of people and wouldn't be able to do much other than yell at him to go away. But as soon as I walked out, he just got in his car and left. This happened every night for about three days straight. The last night I ever saw him was not unlike the others, except this time he didn't leave when I went outside. In fact, he started walking closer to me. I didn't notice until he was a lot closer, but he had something in his hand. I couldn't tell what it was, but it looked like a fairly large knife that you would use in the kitchen. Adrenaline kicked in and I ran back into my house and told my mom to call 911, after which I went back outside. He was just there in the front yard waiting. When I stepped outside, he said, Isabel belongs to me, and I'm going to make that happen no matter what. He ran at me with the knife, but muscle memory kicked in and I had pinned him down after that. The cops came shortly after and I explained the situation to them, after which he was arrested with a couple of different charges that I really don't remember. One other thing I do remember, however, was what was inside of his car. When the police came, they also searched his car to see if he had anything else that I should have been worried about. They found a bunch of tape, some rope, another large knife, a handgun, and a camera. I don't know what was going on through his head, but I could at least guess from the kit he had in his back seat that he planned on hurting me in some type of way and recording it. I hate to think what would have happened if he had tried to come into the house while everyone was asleep, but I'm glad that he was arrested for what he did, or planned to do anyways. Some contacts. Me and my ex were together for two months, and within that time he stole money from me and blamed it on me when I asked him about it. We broke up after I went for advice on Reddit. I go to college for most of the day, go to my work, go home and do homework, then repeat. The story. I was at my job, doing my job, and I get an alert on my phone. I figured that I would watch the cameras after I get home. 
And so over the last two hours, I got three more alerts. And as I was taking the bus back to my home, I watched the cameras. I watched my ex take a hammer to my back door. I kept on watching as he struggled against the deadbolt. And then I saw him enter. I called the police faster than I thought I could and told them that there was a break in at my address. I continued to watch the video after that. 15 minutes after he entered, he left with a duffel bag. I arrived back to my house to see that police had beat me. I identified myself as the homeowner and went inside to check the damage. The place was trashed, along with my duffel bag and some jewelry was missing. I gave the police the evidence that it was my ex and I gave them the place he was crashing at. I then called to put a restraining order against him, along with to replace the deadbolt. Not long after that, they caught him at a pawn shop. He was trying to get back at me for dumping him. I'm now happy that the restraining order is in place, along with my ex being in jail for a year for breaking and entering. Hi everyone, I'm going to start this post by saying that I haven't told anyone about the whole story, mainly because of fear, but also because the guy I'm going to talk about is the son of one of my dad's best friends, and I just know for a fact that my father will inevitably end up blaming all of this on me. Anyways, I'm currently a senior in high school, and I live in a pretty nice town in North Carolina. It all started a year ago when I was 16. At the time, I was working at Starbucks as a barista. It was Thursday, and surprisingly, the cafe was almost empty. A few minutes before the end of my shift, one of my colleagues informed me that a cute guy is here to see you. I was kind of confused. I didn't have a boyfriend at the time, and I'm pretty average, so I couldn't imagine that a guy could be interested in me. As I turned around, I recognized the boy instantly. Henry, my dad's best friend's son. He's three years older than me. And for a reason that I wasn't aware of, he enjoyed making me feel miserable, calling me fat, ugly, and all the other sweet things that you really want to hear as an already insecure teenager. So, for obvious reasons, seeing him at my workplace didn't fill me with joy. Now, on a completely objective point of view, he's a very good looking guy, blonde hair and blue eyes, but he knew that he was attractive which made me want to punch the smirk right off of his handsome face. I know it sounds like some Wattpad type of story, but it really isn't. Henry was actually here to apologize for being a complete douchebag and confess that he actually really did like me, but didn't know how to act around me because I radiate such a powerful energy. It's really destabilizing. Weird timing, but okay. Being the dumb girl that I was, I accepted his apologies, and from that moment on, we kept in touch every day. He would send me good morning and good night texts, give me cute nicknames and whatever else couples do. However, he never asked me to be his girlfriend, but would introduce himself to others as my one true love. I should have seen the red flags from the start. He would show up at my place without asking me at least once a week. I live alone with my dad, who actually really liked the boy so my old man didn't care about his constant presence at home. After a few months into our relationship, I decided to call it off. He was being really possessive. He was jealous of my girlfriends, and I discovered that he was in contact with his previous girlfriend, and he kept on telling me not to worry about it. Yeah, did that ever truly work for anyone? Didn't think so. His reaction wasn't what I expected. He shrugged and was like, Okay, whatever you want, babe. Don't get me wrong, I didn't want him to hurt because of me, but he seemed no chalant about this that it was almost worrying. I thought the story would end here, but oh boy was I wrong. Even after the breakup, he kept on coming over and taking naps on my bed while I wasn't home. When I confronted him about it, he would respond with, I came to see your dad, or we're still friends, I don't see what's bothering you. I tried to tell my dad that Henry and I weren't together anymore and that he had no right to come over and make himself at home in my own room. He just laughed and said that I was being a drama queen, so I guess you understand why I'm kind of stuck at this point. What I didn't know was that Henry was basically following me everywhere. I noticed it a few weeks ago, but I'm pretty sure that it's been going on for quite some time now. 
He would follow my car as I was going to school, park his truck in the Starbucks parking lot whenever I was working, and he would peek through my bedroom window and leave handprints. How did I not notice it before? Well, as a horror movie fan and true crime podcast enthusiast, it's not unusual to feel observed or spied on. Plus, his truck was pretty common, so I couldn't tell if it was him or not. Until a few weeks ago, my car had a problem with one of the tires, so I had to take the bus for a while. One morning as I got out of my house, I saw his truck and immediately made out his face as he was sitting in the driver's seat. And that's when I connected the dots. My gut feeling going in a frenzy whenever I was out. Three of my tires being slashed, the handprints on my bedroom window. When the realization hit me, a shiver ran down my spine. I felt paralyzed and tears welled up in my eyes. I felt nauseous and decided that I needed to talk about it to somebody because I've read enough stories about it and trust me when I tell that crazy ex-boyfriend plus helpless girl don't work out together. I made up my mind and told my friend Tyler, who's five years older than me and is studying law, the whole story. And he unfortunately told me that I couldn't do anything because I didn't have any concrete proof. And it would be my word against Henry's. Now I'm stuck because I don't know what to do. I tried to take pictures of his car, but due to the lack of light in my neighborhood, I never managed to snap one in which we could recognize him. Whenever he's parked in front of my house and we make eye contact, he usually just starts the truck and drives off. I haven't seen him in three days. However, my gut feeling is still making me go crazy. So crazy Henry, let's not meet again. But I know eventually you will show up. My ex JJ was a creep. I was with him for 19 months. This happened around two months into the relationship, just as he was starting to get controlling and it terrified me. It was 2 a.m. and I was in bed. I have super bad insomnia, so I was just listening to YouTube and scrolling through Reddit, not expecting to sleep for at least a couple of hours when I heard a tap, tap on my window. I assumed it was my cat, so I called her name because she always meowed when she heard her name. It was silent, and then tap, tap, tap. I turned my YouTube down and called my cat again. I heard her meow in the bathroom and panic. It wasn't her outside my window. Outside my window is the roof of an extension that was built. It slopes up to my window and can easily be climbed onto via my neighbor's woodshed. At that point, I knew that there was someone out there, but I was too scared to look. I sent JJ a message about it that he was asleep. So, it sent, but didn't deliver. The tapping kept happening. Roughly every 20 seconds, there would be a tap, 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 and then silence. It continued for about 45 minutes while I lay in bed, just listening. I felt like I was stuck in bed, like if I came out from under the quilt, then they would somehow get me. After an hour, I realized it had stopped completely. I pulled myself from my bed and went to my kitchen, where I could see the roof, and I saw a pair of legs dangling over the edge illuminated by a torch. I decided to give up with my room and slept on the sofa with my cat that night. At least, whoever's it was wouldn't know where I was. Next thing I know, I'm waking up to my alarm. I go to turn it off and notice that I have Snapchats from JJ, which is odd but not unheard of. They're from around 3.30 a.m., so probably just after I fell asleep. I open the snaps and my stomach drop. It was a photo of my bedroom window from the outside then a photo of legs dangling into my garden and then a photo of me sleeping on the sofa taken through the kitchen window i messaged him asking what the hell he was doing i got a reply saying he'd come to check on me and chased a guy off from my house at that point he had me convinced that he could do no wrong and if i opposed him i was scared about what might happen so i just left it at that from then on it happened a couple more times and every time I just tried to ignore it. But with the joy of hindsight, I know that I shouldn't have. I should have told someone or broken up with him. But I was too scared of what he might do. I have a lot of stories about JJ. I might write some more. I've been considering putting it in a book somewhere, but I'm not sure. I hope if anyone reads this, 
then they enjoy it. I would like to make something abundantly clear in the beginning of this. I was very naive in my youth. Very naive. While my ex was emotionally, sexually, and mentally abusive, he was smart enough to never lay a hand on me physically. He used gaslighting, manipulation, and carefully hidden sadism to control me for eight years. I forgave him for every slight against me, every instance of cruelty, every mental assault, and every sexual attack. I forgave him because I thought that he loved me and that I was his property because we'd been together for so long and I wore his promise ring. In my mind, I was dealing with actions that would eventually go away with age. I was 17 when I finally got the courage to leave him. And since then, he's left me messages on Facebook, my phone, my email, and called me from texting apps to be a breather. It's always the same message he leaves. I'm still here. Every month, like clockwork, same time, same day, same message. He has done this for six years, and I could do nothing about it. He wasn't breaking any laws, so I couldn't report him, and nobody cared about it anyway. So I blocked each account and continued on with my life. But two months ago, the messages stopped completely, and I know why. I got engaged to another man the same day he messaged me for the last time and posted about it on Facebook. And magically, the messages stopped. He stopped because I'm gonna marry someone else, and in his mind, I'm no longer his property. This is the only thing that makes sense to me, that he believes I belong to the new man and not him. But I have the feeling that I've not seen the last of him. We all have that one ex that just grinds our gears, but mine is fairly more creepy than the average drunk texting asshole. About three years ago, I was in a long distance relationship with a younger man, meaning he was only 17 at the time, while I turned 19 in the relationship. His name is Peter. Peter was not a nice person to say the least. He thought that first impressions he made on people were the only ones that he needed. And as such, he stopped being nice, polite, or reasonable to people after the first meeting. I was young and saw past this, thinking that I could somehow change him. However, this abuse towards people around me and myself eventually became too much and I broke off the relationship with him. The breakup went smoothly, all things considered, except he wanted me to say the words so he could play the victim. This had been a core element of our fighting because he hinted that he wanted the breakup, but instead of just saying it, he kept me on the hook and became even more abusive. I'm getting sidetracked, but the point was that I thought of the matter as resolved and entered a loving relationship with my current boyfriend shortly after this. Then came the day where Peter wanted to get his belongings back. I texted him a list of everything he had left in my apartment and he okayed that it was everything. We also made an appointment for him to stop by my apartment around 3 p.m. the following Thursday. I have no intentions of letting him back into my home, nor being alone with him, since he suddenly seems to have many mood swings after seeing me in another relationship. He's been blocked from my Facebook account, but somehow still knew that I was in a new relationship, which was a major red flag to me and my boyfriend. Thursday came, and I felt eager to just be done with it. My boyfriend and I are walking home from school, when my phone rings. It's Peter. He yells at me that he's now been waiting at the train station for over an hour. I try to reason with him, agree to meet him there with his belongings since he needs to catch a train. My boyfriend walks with me to the train station, but we arrive only to find it vacant. I live in a small town, and the train station is mostly used during rush hours in the morning and evening. It is also located rather bizarrely among normal residences, and there are a lot of off alleyways leading all over town from there. I get a text stating that Peter can see us, but won't come out of hiding when my boyfriend is there. We leave his stuff on a bench at the train station, calmly replying that I'm not actually interested in a meeting with him. When I say calmly, I mean that my reply is calm. I'm shaking, and my boyfriend is furious over this child's play. 
On our way home, I receive another text. This time he states that he has a gift for me and it's in my mailbox. This freaks us out even more, mostly because this indicates that he might be waiting at my home. It is entirely possible that he watched us at the train station and then ran all the way back to my apartment. However, there is no trace of him and nothing except a bill in my mailbox. By now, we figure that he's acting up out of spite and proceed to ignore the bombardment of texts, calls, and so forth that follows that day. After a while, life returns to normal. Then I get another call, this time from my ex's older brother, who is worried about his sibling. Apparently, he's disappeared, taking one of his brother's gas pistols. I'm speechless, but since I haven't seen anything, I shake it off as another childish act. The same day, my boyfriend sees police officers walking around the basement staircase on the exterior of the house we lived in while doing some grocery shopping. He did this every day around 4 p.m. The next day, we were contacted by my boyfriend's mother. It's in the newspaper. There's a description of an unnamed young man from the same town as Peter who has been arrested for attempted robbery of the pizza place that I lived above. He was armed with a knife, a gas pistol, and lighter fluid while stating that he was not attempting a robbery, but there to visit his ex, presumably me. Contacting the police, I discover that he also had a mask, fake papers, a wig, and a duffel bag, which he had thrown down into the staircase when around 4 p.m. he had jumped a vents and tried to enter the pizza place. This means that my boyfriend went out of our front door while my ex was hiding right behind the front door armed. I have never been more freaked out than that ever. The sad truth is that my ex never got charged with anything because he's a minor and has a father with a military background and money. I write this now because after three years, I thought that this horror story was finally a closed chapter. That was until I received a declaration of love from a fake email account signed Peter. I received this just two weeks ago. This happened yesterday, after I finished the night shift at around 3 a.m. I work at a store of a big fast food chain to pay for my university. Our staff changes frequently because of a lot of students and migrants working at our place. So you don't get to know each other very well. Everybody has their own social life. And it's very, very rare for co-workers to establish friendships outside of working hours. Still, you know the people on your shift and the night shift has particularly few workers. One of my co-workers, Jasir, started to get interested in me. Not that I noticed. I'm young and dumb. Like, being friendly and important for later, I have a hard time saying no. In December 2019, our store threw a Christmas party at a pub. I went and had a great time. But I also made plans for later that night. Because of that, I wanted to leave early. Which made Jasir also want to leave early despite the fact he neither needed nor planned it beforehand, which made me uncomfortable. Unfortunately, he didn't know how to get to the train station, and I did, so I couldn't say no and just let him tag along. When we arrived at the train station, it came to light that there was no train that he could take to get home. None. He did not check beforehand. He did not ask me. He just wanted to tag along with me. Now, that made me super uncomfortable. Instead of taking the train to the main station, he got into my train and only got out when I insisted he change his trains at another big station. But oh boy, that was not the train of the title. On January 2020, Jasir asked me out for coffee and I agreed. I thought, he just wants friends. He doesn't have any and can only rely on his co-workers. If something happens, I can just nope out. So I went. First, it was okay. Ish. We mostly talked about work-related stuff, because we don't share any hobbies. We're not the same age, and we don't have the same mother tongue. Language. Jasir didn't like talking about work, and work, and nothing more. He started talking about how different I was from the other co-workers, how nice of a person I am, and how good my charisma is. Then, he asked if we could get to know each other better. 
I genuinely didn't want to, and still don't. Jasir is not my type, neither as a person, nor from his looks, especially his looks. Even if I sound superficial, while I'm in my early 20s, Jasir is at least in his early 30s. I have no problem with age gaps, a story for another subreddit, but I am not attracted to men that dress like teenagers. Instead of telling Jasir a straight no, I told him that I was not interested in having a boyfriend. He didn't take that seriously and told me that I would change my mind. I told him I wouldn't. He, again, was not really on board with that opinion. So I elaborated my opinion three times in German and one time in English to get it very clear. He always changes to English if he does not guess something or thinks he's misunderstood. Even if he heard it clearly and just does not like it, I mean, obviously my opinion is going to change if I explain it in English other than German. We left the conversation with him still not convinced, and me being really not interested in a second meeting. He quit soon after, and I foolishly assumed I was free. But whenever he came to my workplace to place an order, he would ask me out to eat something, and every time I would postpone whatever I said the last time. Because of finals, because of travel because of anything I could get my hands on. Then came COVID-19 that hit Germany in March, and I didn't see him anymore. I blocked him on social media in April, and hoped that that was the last thing to happen. But oh boy, that was not the case. Today, I finished my shift at 3 a.m., and left with my female and very Asian co-worker, Wei, to catch the next train. We take different trains, so we decided to wait in the main lobby until I needed to go to my platform. In that time, Jasir appeared. He just finished his shift and was on his way home. Wei asked him which train he needed to get, and he said that he was walking home. While the conversation went on, I got closer to Wei to get some space between me and Jasir. Wei did not grasp how uncomfortable I was in this situation, and she just walked away. What did Jasir do? He placed himself between me and Wei, right in my vision line. Every fiber in my body felt how he barged into my personal space. I decided I could not take a private conversation with him and said, Oh look, I need to go to get to my platform. But Jasir followed me, through the main lobby, through the train station, into the elevator, and into the train. I was internally screaming and walked through the train until I saw another passenger. I sat down in the row of seats next to me and Jasir followed. As if every bit of luck had just left me, the other passenger moved seats and went away, so I was back alone. Jasir talked and talked, and I showed clear signs of not wanting to continue the conversation. I hoped he would leave before the train departed, but he didn't. Mind you, the train goes in the opposite direction of his house and is one hour walking distance to my workplace. There is no way in hell this man could get anything out of taking that train, except for following me and continuing the conversation. I was freaked out, and told him in English that he was acting very weird. Maybe I should have used a different word, but English is not my first language, and at that point, I only thought about escaping. I could not let him see my station, or he could easily follow me home. I don't live rural, but at 3 a.m., there's nobody on the street so him following me home was terrifying. I thought about getting off a station earlier, but then I would need to get a cab, for which I did not have cash on me. Or I needed to walk and he could still follow. I decided to get up at the next station, let him get out of the train first, and then just stay inside while the doors closed. It fortunately worked, but only after telling him that this was not my station. I would not get out and he would not get back in. I even held my hand out to stop him from coming back. He stayed outside after the conductor shouted at us to let the door close. So let's rewind. He's way older than me, but does not get the concept of me not wanting to be in a relationship with him. Whenever he does not like an answer, he switches to English, because it just might be a misunderstanding. He followed me two times into my train and almost home, without even thinking about how creepy that behavior is. So Jasir, my ex-co-worker, Let's not meet again.
My ex-housemate was potentially a serial killer. This is a convoluted story, so bear with me as I try to convey everything I can recall about what led me to the conclusion that my ex-housemate could have potentially been a serial killer or a serial killer in the making. It was the summer of 2015 when I moved in, and at first appearances, my housemate slash landlord, Mike, was somewhat normal, if not a bit socially awkward and dysfunctional. When I was signing the papers, he was adamant that I should never go into the basement, which I thought was odd, but I really needed a place to stay, and, well, people have their little quirks. So I just chalked it up to that at the time. As I got to know Mike, and our cohabitation continued, I learned more about the depths of his dysfunction. Firstly, that he used meth. Now, I don't automatically judge people based on vices, but I was surprised at the extent of his use. He was probably the first person I knew who used meth and balanced a full-time job, enjoyed a decent amount of success. The reason this is important to the story is that when he would be around the house, drinking and using meth, he would start to run off at the mouth. He would often joke that if I smelled lye coming from the basement, not to think anything of it. I think it was probably the third time he said this that I asked why he keeps saying that. And he said, I just use those chemicals to clean up after the bodies. With a wily grin on his face. I tried to chalk that up to a bad sense of humor, but it didn't set right with me. He was also very particular that I let him know of my coming and going, and my work schedule. I remember him being shocked and uncomfortable one day that I ended up taking off of work because he didn't realize that I was home. I remember that day because there was a lot of clanging and what sounded like muffled shouting coming from the basement. His car was in the driveway, but he was not in the main house or in his bedroom. Other days he would play very loud music that bumped through the whole house. Sometimes he would even play NPR radio at those volumes. In retrospect, I think he may have been trying to mask sounds. He would make remarks about sex workers, saying, You can do whatever you want. You can choke them or beat them to death and nobody cares. I took exception to this. I told him I thought that was messed up. But when he would get tweaking, he'd always come back around to alluding to the same kind of violence, talking about how he was a normal white guy who owned a house and had a good career, so the police would never suspect him. At this point, I start to think that it's gone a bit too far to simply be a joke. I was in a weird position, because money was tight at the time and my options were few. I tried to convince myself that even if he is messed up, he's probably just engaging in outward fanaticism. I knew that he would acquire the services of sex workers on occasion, but again, did not judge that activity at face value, but started becoming concerned. Then. At one point when I was doing laundry, I caught whiffs of decomposition. The house we were in was in southeast Portland. It was relatively new. Having grown up in upstate New York, I know that animals can be trapped in walls and die. But this was the garage, and there were no animals scurrying in the walls. This was strange, and telling to me. I considered carefully what I would do, and decided I would confront him about the smell. I decided to pose the question in a somewhat suggestive way by expanding on his jokes. I told him that he needs to do a better job cleaning up the bodies because I smelled decomposition from the garage. I will never forget his reaction. His eyes widened and he shot me a sharp glare, somewhere between fear and anger. He stumbled over his words and eventually responded, w what? Really? I said, yes, really. And there was a few seconds of awkwardness before he said, Thanks for letting me know. And promptly went into his bedroom and shut the door. A few days after that, he went into the upper crawl space in the garage while I was doing laundry again. He called for me and was trying to convince me to come up into the crawl space. My body locked up, and it was like my instincts were screaming at me that if I went up there, I would not come back down. I gave some excuse that I can sparsely remember that I had to be someplace. I packed up my laundry, threw it in my room, and left. We spent a lot of time in the padlocked basement without a doorknob. The only way in was through the backyard. I wish I would have gone down there in retrospect, to either confirm or dismiss the suspicions once and for all. In the last couple of months I had lived there, I was privy to more graphic comments about women and sex workers, 
explicit talk of sexual violence, and he was using more and more. He once showed me a video that he had made. He's a graphic designer and artist as well, which featured heavy bondage themes interspersed with distorted audio of women screaming and this strange leering figure in a plague doctor costume. It was one of those situations where any one of those things alone may be innocuous, but as they were accumulated, it became suspicious to me. It was October of 2016 that I left there, taking off to Osseti Oyete camp during the anti-pipeline protests with Standing Rock Lakota. A mix of feeling called to action and having nothing else to lose, as I wanted to get out of the house in the worst way. My last night there, I did not give notice that I was leaving. He was drinking and tweaking again. Started in on the same conversation, loosely describing murder and violence in the tone of some sort of edgy joke. I told him he would be caught eventually, not even holding back my suspicion anymore. He reiterated that he was the last person police would suspect and asserted that they wouldn't catch him. I said this in a very serious and concise way, dropping the pretense that he had been using before. I left the next morning. This haunted me for months, then a year, then a year and a half. I felt as though I hadn't done anything. The guilt was eating away at me, so I called Portland Crime Stoppers and put in an anonymous tip describing what I had described there. When I did, the operator started going back and forth, putting me on hold, because the call had piqued the interest of the police sergeant who was assigned to the call center. So they were asking me detailed questions about his vehicle, his house, the methods he described, etc. It seemed like they took interest. I gave them as much information as I could remember and left it at that, feeling just a little bit better that I had at least tried to do something about it. Fast forward to recent times. I told my mother about all of this, and she became interested, asking what house this was, and she ended up pulling it up on Google Maps. She put it up on Street View, and I noticed that there was a large enclosed trailer in the driveway that wasn't there when I was. I could theorize why it might have been there, but cannot put together a practical reason for it, or why he'd be using it, unless it was moving, or using it to haul things to discard. Admittedly, that is pure congesture, but I couldn't help but wonder. I doubt that I'll get closure, or have my suspicions validated unless he does finally get caught and arrested. And I read about it. I've grown up poor, and been around the low life a lot. I've interacted with many sketchy and unsavory people in my time, but none of them have ever made the impression that Mike made on me. keep a long story short, my ex-best friend Alyssa and I were friends for almost seven years. We had a good, healthy relationship. She was my ride or die. We did everything together, but we slowly started to drift away when I exchanged schools. We saw each other after school, so it was cool. Well, a year passed and I started to notice Alyssa hanging out with the wrong crowd, and I didn't want any part of that. I started to notice how Alyssa would pick on me about my appearance and clothing but she used to dress like me. We used to be dripped in anime merch, but ever since, she started to hang out with more mature college people she changed. She would constantly tell me that I'm fat, ugly, or nobody loves me at all. That type of stuff. And my last straw was when she called my family poor. I lost it, because my family has helped her with financial problems, and even gotten them out of debt. So I stopped being friends with her, and I started to hang out with new people and get to know myself more. I've made a new best friend and everything was great, but I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched from every corner. I always felt like someone was there, but I ignored it. Months passed by and I still can't shake the feeling of being watched, and that's when stuff started to happen. My car would end up getting keyed, my tires were popped, and weird letters I had to decipher started to show up on my front porch. But I'm dumb and just decided to ignore the problems. A year later, I decided to hang out with some old friends from the group, and that's when I found out everything. Alyssa was the one doing those things to me, 
and every letter she sent was a death threat. My friend Tori, the one who witnessed everything, told me how Alyssa would stalk me and get mad that I replaced her with a guy. That's not what creeped me out. Turns out, Alyssa copied everything. I got a 2018 Nissan Sentra, and she got the same car. Inside my dashboard on my car, I have my Hero Academia figures and South Park figures. And she went as far as to get the same type of figures online and put them on her dashboard. She would wake up at 6 a.m., drive to my house, and wait for me to wake up and get out of the house so she could follow me. She tried adding my friends on social media and tried to convince them to leave me for her because she's a better friend than me. She even got the same clothes as I did. According to Tori, when she would visit Alyssa at her house, Alyssa would have the same anime posters. I didn't believe her at first until she showed me pictures. Everything was the same, as if Tori was seeing double of everything. Lucky for me, Alyssa was forced to move up north with her father. Her grandma kicked her out of her house, and everything went back to normal. For now, I'm just scared when she comes over for holidays and starts to stalk me again. Thank you for listening to all of the stories in this video. I hope you enjoyed them. I also hope that you enjoy the extra light thunder sound storms at the end. Have a great night, everyone. And I'll read to you in the next video. Bye-bye now.